Welcome to Coming Together. I'm David Futransky, member of the class of ETHS 1969 and the Senior Director of Institutional Advancement at Evanston Township High School. I work with our foundation and our alumni association, and today I get to introduce a session of Coming Together to you. We have with us two of our newest distinguished alumni, uh, Professor Rick Pildes from NYU Law School and Ben Wolf, the retired legal director of the ACLU of Illinois. Hosting and moderating the session is Allison Miller. Allison is the class of 1997 at ETHS and is currently the chief of staff and policy for uh, state's attorney Kim Fox in Cook County. I'm going to turn this over to Allison and let her take us through a discussion about the American Legal System 2021. It's all yours, Allison. Welcome to Coming Together. My name is Allison Miller. I'm joined today by Professor of Law at Nor uh, New York University School of Law, Rick Pildes. And I am joined with the former uh, director of the ACLU, Ben Wolf. Thank you very much for joining me here today. Um, we find ourselves here today on this episode of Coming Together um, because both of these gentlemen are on site to be the recipients of the Distinguished Alumni Award. So thank you very much, both of you, for being here in connection with that. I recognize that this is one of the few times that we've had the opportunity in 2022 to get together face to face. So you'll recognize that we are masked up appropriately, but uh, this is quite a significant recognition for both of these gentlemen who have very been have been very widely recognized, and uh, we find ourselves in person today. So, thank you, thank you. As you all know, Coming Together is an alumni series that focuses on looking at the challenges and the turbulence of the years 2020, 2021, 2022, and beyond and as program guests offer perspectives on where we go from here. Uh, episodes include ETHS alumni's viewpoints on pressing issues and solutions that they are working on. So I, before I continue, I will turn it over to each one of these individuals to give a brief uh, introduction to themselves. Uh, and so before we continue, I'll turn it over to Professor Pildes. Thanks very much, Allison. So I graduated from Evanston Township High School in 1975. And uh, eventually I found my way to law school. Uh, and then I uh, clerked for federal judges for a couple of years uh, along the way before I went into my, my full-time career as, a, as an academic a law professor. So I clerked for Abner Mikva first, who people go back in Chicago will know. He was uh, a congressman from Hyde Park and from Evanston, actually, later on in his life. He also was the uh, uh, top lawyer in the White House to President Clinton. He was a federal judge in DC. Uh, so that was an amazing Chicago legal experience I had. But then after that, I clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall on the Supreme Court. And that was, of course, a once in a, a lifetime uh, experience. Uh, and from there, I began teaching at the University of Michigan Law School. And for the last 20 years, I've been teaching at New York University Law School. And as you said, uh, I focus on legal issues involving American democracy, elections, voting, American government, powers of Congress, the President, the Supreme Court, uh, and that's what I've devoted my time to. I also litigate cases, argue in the courts, uh, as well as being an academic. Great to have you. Mr. Wolf? I graduated a few years before Professor Pildes in 1971 from Evanston High School. Uh, graduated from law school in 79, uh, and since 1984, until I retired last year, I was a lawyer at the American Civil Liberties Union, eventually becoming the legal director. Uh, and spent my career representing people mostly in government custody, children in the juvenile detention center in Cook County, prisoners, uh, people uh, in the foster care system, in nursing homes, um, and then when I was uh, supervising everybody at the ACLU legal staff. I worked on all kinds of issues involving rights, including challenges to the Trump administration's policies on immigration and racial justice and a variety of other things. Thank you very much. So let's turn to our first question. Um, 
It's been in the news a lot. Uh, Justice Stephen Breyer's retirement. I'll just open it up to the floor. There uh, are a number of cases that are, are up for consideration. This is always a pivotal, uh, pivotal moment when there's a retirement of a justice. Where do we find ourselves given this current environment in what we are looking at uh, with the court? So one way I'll put this in a little bit of perspective for people is, um, as you just said, Supreme Court nominations and the confirmation process have become some of the most politically charged, controversial, contentious issues in our society. Uh, and that's because the court has come to be a very, very powerful institution and because justice has served for so long now. So as we know, people have stayed healthier much longer in life. Presidents look for younger nominees to appoint. Um, and now it turns out that, that uh, people serve on the court for 30, 40 years. Uh, Justice Breyer served 27 years before retiring. Justice Thomas has already been on the court for 30 years. And so all of this means that these appointments are so consequential because the court has become so powerful and because people are on the court for so long. Uh, in many ways, I think that's not good for the court or for the country. And one of the things I like to point out is that part of the reason these issues are so contentious in the US is we are the only country that has lifetime tenure for our federal judges. So if you look at other major democracies and their top courts, all of them except the US have either fixed terms of office, typically 12 years, 15 years, or they have mandatory retirement ages, typically 70. When our constitution was set up, the framers were so interested in ensuring that the courts would be independent that they wouldn't be subject to a lot of political manipulation, uh, that they used lifetime tenure, which may have been a, a, an appropriate starting point. But today, we have discovered you can have very strong independent courts without lifetime tenure. Uh, and I think it's just helpful to put all of these issues in that perspective to help people understand part of why these are such contentious, such charged, major moments in our politics when we're talking about the appointment of a judge to a court, not about the adoption of some major policy. Um, Thank you. I'll turn it over to, to, to you, Mr. Wolf. I think that this is a, a really great point that's been hit on over here. There's a constant, there is a tension in the legal community around the validity or the, the, the lifetime appointment versus the term of years aspect and whether that creates a politicization around the court system. Um, what are your thoughts around some of these, certainly as we're looking at you know, longer lifespans and some of these other um, uh, aspects that exist here as it relates to what, how that shapes uh, the importance of the Supreme Court? Well, I think part of what's happened to emphasize the importance of how long people are on the court is the way the process of confirming justices has become so political and so manipulated. Donald Trump was able to appoint three Supreme Court justices in just a four-year term, whereas President Obama was only able to appoint two Supreme Court justices in an eight-year term, partly because filling the final seat uh, was, was delayed. Uh, by the Senate uh, for political reasons and waiting for the election results in an unprecedented, an unprecedentedly long period of time. Um, in, the, in the era of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, the court became the centerpiece of enforcing civil rights laws and principles and the Bill of Rights in this country. That wasn't true in most of our history. And I'm afraid with the current trend toward a very conservative Supreme Court and even President Biden's new appointment, and he's, he's considering reportedly some outstanding African-American women. It's about time we had an African-American woman on the court. Um, but even with a terrific appointment, which I would anticipate from him, and confirmation in the Senate, the court's gonna stay very conservative and it's gonna become increasingly difficult to enforce civil rights laws in federal courts. And so we've got a battle on our hands to, to enforce the basic principles of voting rights and justice and fairness and free protection from racial and gender discrimination among many other things. And I think Americans are gonna to have to try other ways, state and local elections, demonstrations, 
changing values at the street level to get where they want to go. So I think we've sort of jumped in at sort of, you know, part two of the conversation, but let's walk it back for the viewers at home. Exactly what is the impact effect of the Supreme Court? How does it fit in the larger landscape of all the, what you're talking about as it relates to uh, civil rights, jurisprudence? What is the role of the Supreme Court? The, the Supreme Court interprets the law. Um, and that has come to mean a lot of different things, but we are a country with a written constitution. So when the law says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, and the 14th Amendment is interpreted as applying that principle to state and local government, the Supreme Court becomes the primary protector of the rights to freedom of expression and freedom of speech. And that has enormous consequences, protecting the right of Dr. King to march in Cicero near Chicago and in Selma, Alabama, uh, protecting the rights of labor marchers, protecting the rights of people to write and read what they want and see the movies they want. Um, and then as the 20th century emerged, the court became the enforcer of other principles, equal protection of the law, uh, which came to include and should always have included people of color and uh, women and people with disabilities. And increasingly, I think we have turned to the Supreme Court and then the federal courts generally for the law that the Supreme Court interprets to be enforceable um, to protect on behalf of vulnerable people who can't get a fair shake in the legislature to protect basic rights like civil liberties and civil rights and racial justice. And the court has been the center of that debate in the 20th and early 21st century. But I think that's starting to shift back to the states and to the people. And um, in many ways, I wish it didn't. I wish the court still was willing to do its job, to be firm in its support for basic rights but I think we're not gonna see that in the near future. Professor Poldis, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'd like you to pick up just that end, but also within the framework of how the courts then relate to the executive branch and the legislative branch, right? I think as we're trying to like frame this whole relationship of the democratic government that we have particularly set up in the United States of America, that just giving that relationship between those two other branches is probably from a perspective standpoint, uh, a, a, a good direction to go in. Sure. So one of the things the Supreme Court does that's very important that people don't focus on quite as much is when Congress passes the laws, the laws have to be interpreted. And those interpretations can make an enormous difference uh, in terms of how the law gets applied and understood. And if Congress was not as paralyzed, it wouldn't matter quite so much how the court interpreted the laws Congress has enacted because Congress would come back into the picture and say, no, you made a mistake. This is what we want the law to mean. But because our system is so polarized and Congress is so gridlocked, the Supreme Court's decision, even on how to read federal laws, is, is often final. Whatever the court says, Congress is not going to overturn it one way or the other. And, you know, we're talking about laws ranging from laws that protect civil rights, protect against employment discrimination, uh, laws on uh, health care related issues, pretty much everything Congress does, ultimately the court has to interpret. Then on top of that, the court enforces the boundaries between different parts of our government. It holds the president to limits under the Constitution. It holds Congress to the limits on its powers. It holds the state legislatures to limits on their powers. And those are constitutional decisions, meaning that the court is definitely final on those issues. Because unless the Constitution is amended, a legislature can't change what the court says about the powers of the president or the powers of, of Congress or the state legislatures. So in a system of divided powers like we have, we have a separation of powers between the president and Congress. We have a, a, a complicated legislative process, more complicated than some other systems, with a House and a Senate. And to enact legislation, you need the House and the Senate and the President all to agree. It's a system that was meant to make it difficult to legislate, and it does. And the filibuster certainly you know, adds to that. Uh, the, all of that means the court is just a very, very important institution. Uh, and over time, it has become involved in almost every major cultural, social, 
issue that is contentious, whether we're talking about abortion or religion issues or free speech issues. Uh, and so both in interpreting federal law and deciding what the Constitution means, uh, the Supreme Court is an extremely powerful institution, uh, much more powerful than it was probably originally envisioned to be. Uh, and that's part of why these rare appointments, when they come open, uh, become the, the product of, or the focus of so much intense conflict and controversy. Um, and and that's, that's where we are, and it's hard to unwind uh, ourselves from that point. Uh, as I said before, I'm not sure it's good for the court uh, that, that, that it itself has become so central to our politics, but that's the reality that it is. You hit on that, a very important point. It has become central to our politics. So a question, is the court political or not? Well, <laughs> that's a long, we discussed this at great length in law schools. Um, a lot of different ways of answering that. Sure. So, so I tend to think that the court is two different institutions. There's 80 some percent of the cases uh, where the court is either unanimous or close to unanimous. A lot of these cases are below the radar. They don't get a lot of public attention. They can be significant, uh, but they're more traditionally, like I would call them legal issues, legal mm -hmm. cases. Then there's some percentage, I put it at about 15% really, that are the ones that are on the front page of the newspaper. Uh, and those cases often involve uh, interpreting vague provisions in the Constitution uh, where there's not a lot of really, really specific rules and where the different political jurisprudential philosophies of the justices clearly make a difference. Uh, and so I, I think of the court as these two courts. And one court is the most visible court to the public, uh, and that's the court where we see these kinds of differences uh, you know, play out in significant ways. Then there's the 80% of the cases uh, that it functions more like uh, the lower federal courts or most of our other courts. Uh, so the, the, there's no question these appointments matter. We wouldn't have these fights if the appointments didn't matter. Uh, and they matter because different justices bring different philosophies of how to interpret the Constitution uh, to bear. There's no question about that. Uh, if they didn't, we wouldn't have these kinds of fights. They wouldn't be at this at this level. Um, so, so yes and no. <laughs> okay, yes and no. How do? What is your response to two two courts, one court? How many courts are we talking about in the Supreme Court? Well, I think Professor Pildes is right that the more controversial cases um, highlight the importance of the role of the Supreme Court and perhaps the political partisan uh, aspect of the court. Um, I don't have, I don't think there's a principal distinction between our political values and our personal values. And uh, a lot of what the justices bring to the court is interpreting the language in accordance with what they think matters, you know. So if you're looking at something like equal protection of the law, um, there's a view that we ought to look back to what people thought in the, in the 1860s, try to anticipate how they would decide a case, and then simply stick to that. And then there's another view, which I support, that, uh, that the, the Constitution articulates a principle, and that we come to understand what equality really means in a different way over time as we become a more inclusive, uh, society and as we're open to data about how people can achieve things in different ways in different groups um, and then we interpret the language uh, pursuant to those values and and not because we change the language but because what we're bringing to the decision is so different um, so I don't know you call that politics you call that uh, thoughtfulness you call that uh, receptiveness to learning I'm not sure, but I think that's an important part of being a justice. So what, what, what's at play right now? What's at stake? What's, what are, we've talked about some of the cases that are more of the, the legal interpretations, and then we've got that 15, 
we won't hold, we won't hold anyone any numbers here, yeah. but we've got that other smaller percentage that is a little bit more visible that has a significant aspect, uh, significant impact. What what's at what's at play here? Well, I think a lot of the way America functions is in play. The more highly publicized things are things like the right to abortion and the right to terminate a pregnancy. I think in maybe half the states, maybe a little more, um, if the Supreme Court strikes down or diminishes Roe versus Wade, which I think it's about to do in one form or another, you're gonna see a lot of women, women who are forced to carry pregnancies to term after a point very early in a pregnancy. It's gonna change a lot of lives. It's gonna change a lot of choices. It's gonna cause some women to die. Um, in areas like equal protection of the laws or voting rights or civil rights, you're gonna see a lot of restrictions in the role in, of federal courts. We already are. Supreme Court already gutted one of the most important provisions of the Voting Rights Act that required preclearance of certain kinds of restrictions on the right to vote in states with a history and localities with a history of telling people they can't vote based on race and making it hard for people to vote based on race. When that restriction was lifted, we immediately started to see various kinds of experiments and restrictions in a lot of those states. And increasingly, although there was a period of expanding the right to vote in a variety of ways, increasingly, I think we're seeing states experiment with how to make it hard for people of color to vote. And some states are gonna make that very hard in the coming years, and the court's gonna let them. Uh, and Congress doesn't seem able to amend the Voting Rights Act to return some of those uh, things that, that many of us believe were misinterpreted in this by the Supreme Court. So I think that's going to stick. Um, and there's so many others. You know, I, I did institutional reform litigation trying to fix institutions like the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center and the Illinois Department of Corrections and the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services and their systemic mistreatment of people in government custody, I think those cases are gonna become much harder to, to pursue. Class actions on behalf of vulnerable people that have somewhat different needs but are all suffering from the same institutional problems, I think the Supreme Court increasingly is gonna make that difficult to do that kind of case and we're gonna to have to find other ways to address those problems. So we've talked about the court overturning Roe versus Wade. We'd made some references to the, the Supreme Court's decision being, for lack of a better word, final. Why, why are we still, why, why is this still up for discussion? Why, what, is, what is the mechanism that leads to a decision like Roe versus Wade being discussed now? We find ourselves in, in 2022. I guess I'm not quite sure uh, what you're asking me. Why is why is Roe versus Wade being reconsidered potentially by the court? Or yes. All the decisions. How to? So I, I think we have a a political mechanism for choosing justices. You know, we have the elected president and the Senate. Those are the institutions that choose justices. The system was designed to reflect, to some extent political influence or the the role of elections over time mm -hmm. in filling the court. Not all countries, you know, pick judges that way. Uh, in some countries they have commissions, uh, non-political commissions for choosing justices. So we have a system that was designed to be responsive to some extent, not in some immediate day-to-day -day way, but, but to reflect the changing political preferences of the country. Um, and uh, on all of these issues, these contentious issues, whether it's you know issues of gun rights, whether it's uh, affirmative action, whether it's abortion, whether it's the relationship of religion to the state, um, the court will over time be somewhat reflective of changes in public opinion in that in, in those areas. There's been a, 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 a you know concerted opposition to Roe versus Wade that became stronger over time. Uh, the Supreme Court already had cut back on Roe versus Wade in a, a number of ways over several decades. Um, it looks poised to continue that in that area. We'll see what happens with the cases that are before it now. Uh, but I think that. Um, you know, as Ben was saying, uh, because elections matter for who gets appointed to the court, 
if more conservative forces win elections, eventually you're going to have justices who are likely to reflect those strands in American political culture. If more liberal justice, if more liberal presidents and senates get elected, um, you're going to see justices who are going to tend to reflect that on these big controversial 15% uh, of the cases that are the ones that, that really you know, capture public attention because they, they do matter so much. Um, so, uh, you know, most things are, uh, it, it don't, in politics and in law, things don't always move in one direction. We, we like to think they do. You know, we, think, we like to think there's a direction to history, uh, but there's a lot of back and forth uh, over time. Uh, that, that's, and I think you see that in our politics you inevitably see it reflected to some extent in our law. You touched briefly on uh, voters' rights. We skipped over to Roe versus Wade, but I want to I want to return back to that. Um, there have been a number of uh, uh, there's been some legislation in a number of different states that, as you said, have appeared to make it more difficult for people to uh, to gain access to the polls. I, I'll, I will. I would turn it back over to you. I'm, I'm curious to see uh, what your thoughts are on, on the impact of those partic that particular legislation. But what, to my earlier question about Roe v. Wade, what, what are we actually discussing with regard to voters' rights? What is actually in front of uh, the Supreme Court, up for being in front of the Supreme Court and for discussion around this topic? I think there are two different kinds of issues, and they're both really important. The one that gets more attention is probably less important, but it still matters. That's the burdens put in the way of voters. Um, in general, voting, opportunity to vote, to vote early, to vote by mail, to vote by drop box, has increased in the last decade or two. Uh, and in the last election, because of COVID, uh, a majority of voters didn't vote in person on election day, but other methods, early voting and voting by mail, were more typical. Um, and that seems to have worked very well. There's very little evidence of significant voter fraud, and the process um, worked well and delivered a pretty high turnout. Um, as a result of that, there now is an effort in some states to make it harder to vote, and that's partly a product of President Trump's unwillingness to accept the results of the election. And so <clears throat> there are some states cutting back on or eliminating early voting. There are restrictions on where you can have drop boxes. There are uh, reductions in the number of polling places that make it harder, particularly for people of color, to vote. Um, and I think those things may have some impact, and that's significant. And the federal legislation to stop some of those things seems to be headed nowhere. Um, the second thing that I think is more important is the integrity of the election in 2020 in many ways was saved by, by the integrity of some election officials in some states. A Republican Secretary of State in Georgia refused to overturn the results of the election when he was pressured by the Republican president. Uh, Republican and Democratic officials in places like Michigan and Wisconsin and Arizona basically did their jobs in, in positions where they're supposed to count the vote fairly. There's an effort to undercut that. There's an effort right now for people to run for those offices or be appointed to those offices who don't seem to be committed to a fair count of the vote. And in a few places like Georgia, there's also an effort to let legislatures and other explicitly political and partisan bodies to declare who won the election irrespective of the count of the vote. I think that's the real threat in some ways. I mean, restricting the opportunity to vote is a big deal for, for some people in some places. I'm not diminishing it. But if you really take integrity out of the process and put partisan politics in charge of counting or determining the winner, then we're in real trouble as a democracy. And I'm hoping the courts, if necessary, but mostly the people, will push back on that and simply not elect many of those people and not allow those people to serve in a way that undermines democracy. Professor Pildes. Yeah, I, I have the same worry, uh, and it's, it's, it's horrible that in the United States we actually have to worry about this now for the first time in maybe 100 years or, or so. For the, the idea that people are concerned, and with reason, uh, that, that the integrity of the vote process will be compromised, that the winner of the election will somehow have that election 
subverted, that outcome subverted because of the officials who are involved in administering our elections. And part of the problem is because of the onslaught against election officials who did their job in 2020, many of those people came under personal threat, their families came under threat, they've been harassed. Many of those people have retired, they've resigned. It's too miserable a job to do. And some of the people looking to replace them uh, are clearly much more partisan activists who we don't necessarily have confidence are going to administer the election according to the law. And the worry is up and down the system. The worry is local election officials, the worry is secretary of, secretaries of state, depending on who gets elected, governors potentially, state legislatures, and even Congress where we now have to be concerned, will Congress decide to reject the votes from a particular state? So there are reasons to worry about the, the integrity of the election process as a whole. Uh, now there are things that are being done uh, to try to shore up the system. Uh, I'm involved in a number of those efforts. That's where I'm focusing most of my energy right now. Uh, I think, I, I am hopeful that you know we won't actually face this problem, but there are reasons to worry about it right now, given what we're seeing going on out there. Um, people who acted with integrity in 2020 uh, are being challenged and may not get back into those jobs. I, I should say one of the things to notice here is, again, because we are, so, we are all so used to the way we do things, we have partisan elected officials who oversee our elections. You know, we elect secretaries of state. Uh, we elect even some of the local county officials who administer elections. Uh, I don't think that's a good way to structure the system of administering elections. And again, many democracies have independent commissions, independent institutions that oversee their elections and administer their elections. So part of the reason we are facing these challenges now is because we have decided we're going to elect these people. We're going to elect them on partisan tickets in many contexts, Democrats or Republicans. And uh, now you have all of the worries about partisan manipulation mm -hmm. potentially creeping into the system. And we have not really had this worry in the United States. I mean, there in the past we did, uh, but it's been a long time since we've had to face that threat in a, in a serious way. I'm hoping Congress will do something about some aspects of it that Congress can handle. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, courts are gonna play a significant role, state courts and federal courts, in ensuring the integrity of the voting process in our upcoming elections. So you'd mentioned that there's there's some work that's being done and, and you'd compared, uh, at least compared in contrast, the US system with some other existing systems out there. Could you go into a little bit more detail of what, what does the alternative view look like? Well, my view, <laughs> which I mean, which is not gonna happen yeah. um, because there's so much, and, and, and there's so much resistance across the political spectrum yeah. to this. Um, I'm a believer in independent institutions, not partisan actors, being the entities that administer elections. Um, now in the US, uh, uh, people, as I say, across the political spectrum don't trust independent institutions. They immediately say, well, who's gonna be independent? You know, how can you ensure that they're gonna be fair and impartial? Uh, but it, we don't have to even be talking about perfect independence, just more independent from immediate partisan political pressures. So if you're asking me, that would be where I would start. I would, I would push in that direction. I've been in favor for decades now uh, of the use of independent commissions to draw election districts uh, instead of allowing, for example, the Illinois legislature to gerrymander you know, the districts for Democrats or the Texas legislature to gerrymander districts for Republicans. Uh, but it, and we have made some progress on that front. A number of states have moved to independent commissions, but it's a tough sell in the United States. People distrust institutions that they, that are, they don't feel they can control through elections. Uh, so uh, I think we need to uh, pass laws to protect those officials who act with integrity in the election administration process, we need to make it a crime to try to intimidate, harass, coerce election administrative officials. 
Um, we need to, uh, at the level of Congress, protect the presidential election process through legislation, which I'm hoping a bipartisan Congress is going to enact in the next six months or so. Uh, and we need to rely on the courts to ensure that the law is actually followed uh, by, by state election officials when they're running the elections. This sounds very much in line with your, you know, the, the smaller point uh, is a little bit more impactful, right? There, there seems like there's a, an undercurrent, a sort of pulling of the, the fabric, uh, unraveling that one string. It seems like this is a pretty significant undercurrent of, of our democracy. Um, what are your thoughts uh, as it relates to this tension and this uncertainty that's being created around the integrity of our voting system? Well, I've lived in the same house in Evanston for 35 years, and I grew up in another community in Evanston after second grade. Um, and in time, uh, I became familiar with these local folks who would be at our polling place. You grew up in Evanston. You may have a similar experience, both of you. Um, I think they were from both political parties. They, you know, they tended to be a little older. Um, they were just people committed to the process, and they would get up early on election day, and they would be election judges and officials, and they would make the thing work. And um, the, the roots of our democracy involved so many people like that who just make elections work because they care about democracy, even if their favorite candidate doesn't win. And I'm hoping that's still out there, and I'm hoping that feeling will prevail. But as Professor Pilda said, uh, and as you said, I mean, it's, it's, scary. it's a scary time. There's, at least in my lifetime and in what I've read about for a very long time, there hasn't been that kind of push against integrity directly that there is now. And I'm hoping we turn away from that. I, I still like to think we're a decent country. I think that's really interesting that you you flag that that push against integrity, and I know you know you have mentioned you know clerking with for Thurgood Marshall and Mikva, and you have also mentioned your experiences around civil rights and, and voting. How does are there any parallels emotionally that we're seeing between now and 1965 when we were when I would say that there were possibly questions about integrity. And, 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 and I'm, I'm receptive to the pushback and sort of shaping what, you know, what that point of conversation is. But, but how, how, how are we feeling about these two points in time? Well, it's certainly true that in the South, in the period leading in 100 years leading up to the Voting Rights Act, um, there was a deliberate, systematic, and effective push, and in many northern communities, against people of color voting. I mean, that was profound. That was worse than what we're seeing now. It was not just an effort. It was successful almost everywhere. My father, who was a rabbi on the North Shore, took a busload down to Selma to march with Dr. King. And I remember I was 10 years old uh, or 12 years old. I remember at the time talking to him about why he was going there. and. He wanted to caution me that something bad might happen. And, you know, I was, I was a kid. I was saying, well, why, why do you want to go down there and maybe get beat up or whatever, you know, arrested? What's the deal? You know, and he said, this is, this is how we fight for our, our country. This is, this is not just for other people. This is for us. You know, we need justice and equality for everybody or we're all in trouble. Um, and, and I think it is important for us living now to remember that past generations dealt with even greater violence and injustice. And, and you're right that there was absolutely no integrity in many places in those days to the voting process. And, and we got past that and we passed the Voting Rights Act. It's not perfect, but I mean, we passed the Voting Rights Act and the kind of ridiculous disenfranchisement of black people in the South largely ended. Uh, and we were making progress and, and elections uh, became more inclusive and we had more early voting and we had made it easier without conditions to vote absentee and um, it, it felt like uh, things were moving in the right direction but as Professor Pilda said the sweep of history isn't always linear and uh, now we got to fight some of those battles again but I think it really is important to remember uh, on whose shoulders we stand 
and that they fought in sometimes harder battles and scarier battles. You know, John Lewis was beaten up repeatedly fighting for civil rights. I go to court, you know, and I fight for civil rights and I'm proud of myself and I win some victories. It's nothing like what he went through, you know. So let's, let's be grateful for the advantages we do have and let's not allow a retreat from integrity. Professor? Yeah, so uh, for one example of things in 1965, on the eve of the enactment of the Voting Rights Act, in Mississippi, only 6% of African Americans were registered to vote because Mississippi had made it so difficult to register to vote if you were black back then. So, uh, so you know, that was what things were like in parts of the South in 1965, and it was the way the South had been since the 1890s, early 1900s. Um, you know, there were literacy tests. There were understanding clauses, meaning the registration official would say, do you understand this provision? Tell me what it means. And then they could decide whether they wanted to register you or not. Uh, there were poll taxes. I mean, there were all sorts of barriers to voting. Um, that began to break down with the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And we reached a point in many parts of the South now where uh, black turnout and white turnout is the same, comparable registration rates are comparable. In some elections, African-American turnout is greater than white turnout. Uh, so we're not in a situation of 1965. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned about illegitimate obstacles that are put in the way of, of people participating in the political process. And we should also, of course, you know, insist that there be integrity to the outcome and that the lawful winner of the election is actually made the winner of the election and that the process is subverted or corrupted by partisan political machinations and maneuverings and manipulations. Uh, and so, um, you know, as Ben said, voting is more accessible now than it has ever been. Uh, we have uh, expansive early voting in lots of states, not everywhere. My state of New York is one of the worst about making the system accessible. Um, in most states, they have absentee voting without any excuse. Uh, so you don't need to prove that you're going to be out of the jurisdiction. So those are good developments. Early voting only even began 15 years ago in the United States. But there are still you know, efforts to make it more difficult for people in some places to vote. Uh, and uh, uh, there's distrust about the election process. And, and we just have not really had that in a significant way in a long time. Uh, political actors manipulate perceptions about that. They stoke the sense of distrust. But if you look at the polling data, uh, it's, it's people on both sides of the spectrum who don't, who don't trust the process anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a scary thing in a democracy. I mean, that can be a very dangerous moment in a democracy if people don't believe the outcome of the election is legitimate because the process has been manipulated or corrupted. And we have to do everything we can. You know, it's an incredibly precious achievement uh, to have democratic elections that are accepted, where the losers accept the outcome because the process is legitimate and fair. Uh, one of the things we pride ourselves on as a country is we are the only democracy that has always had our elections no matter what. So even during the Civil War, we had an election. A lot of democracies don't do that. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, despite some of the problems we've talked about, you know, we have had, uh, the longest continuous kind of constitutional democracy where people basically accept the legitimacy of the outcome. And that's now in question. And whether that will continue to be the case is a, it, it is a very troubling thought. Um, but I do think it's something we have to confront now. So in the true spirit of coming together, the overarching question is, you know, where do we go from here? So I, I, I open that up to the table for discussion. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Wolf. Where do we go from here? Well, I think it's a free enough country that we're still able to fight for our rights. And I see a lot of encouraging signs. I, uh, my daughters who graduated from Evanston High School uh, 10 years ago, about nine or 10 years ago, um, 
and their friends, I think, are more compassionate and uh, less subject to discrimination and more willing to take to the streets and to, and to make sure they vote and to advocate for what they want in public spaces than a lot of people in my generation. And um, I think we will, as, as Franklin said, we'll have a republic if we, if we keep it. I think if I think if we fight for it, we can have more justice and more decency, and and I look forward to seeing it. Where do we go from here, Where Professor? Do we go from here, you know, I guess I am fundamentally kind of an optimistic person by nature. That's what Justice Breyer said, by the way, when he gave his speech retiring from the court, um, and I responded to that because I think I have uh, basically a sense of optimism. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, we are in a rough period. Uh, the country's incredibly divided. Honestly, I think social media has been a hugely negative force in our politics. I mm -hmm. think it's really stoked the divisiveness, uh, the nastiness. Um, and so we are in a bad moment. Um, I have various institutional reforms I would make uh, that I think could help make a difference. Uh, they're probably too technical to get into here. Um, and most of them would happen at the state level. At the, you know, I think we focus too much on the national level, uh, by the way. A lot of important things go on at the state level. And a lot of political reform can take place at the state level. And that's where most of our political reforms have come from. They start at the state level. And then some of them eventually get adopted and brought up through national legislation. Uh, I, so I, I think we are in a tough period. I, I, I think the country is, is really as divided as it's been in a long, long time. Uh, but at the end of the day, I still think, um, you know, I'm optimistic we will get to a better place. All right, closing out on optimism. I yeah. love it. Before you guys escape, I've got a couple of rapid fire questions for you based uh, around ETHS, Evanston. And so it's five questions. I will just ask them. Quickly as you can respond, first thing that comes to mind, okay? So, start with the professor over here. Orange or blue? Orange or blue, I have to choose? Blue. Orange or blue? Orange. Okay, bacon, Beardsley, Bolt Order, Michael? Uh, Michael. It's Beardsley. Okay, favorite place on campus? The indoor track. Uh, the debate team. Play classroom. Okay. Favorite spot in Evanston? Wow. The beach. Lakefront. Lakefront. All right. All right. This is a little bit bigger. Influencer from your days at ETHS. What was the impact? Wow. I think my track and field, the sports, was a huge influence on me when I was in high school. Uh, just working with people from such different backgrounds on something that, you know, I invested lots of time in. Uh, I, I think that really made a very deep impression on me here. So not a particular person, but the experience of sports. Okay. And for the closeout. Um, I would say a professor, a teacher named Ken Nye, who was the debate coach, but was also just a person of fundamental decency and warmth and kind of helped me get through high school. And uh, I appreciate him. I was. Uh, I was not a consistent student, and I needed some compassionate adults. Thank you very much for your honesty. <laughs> well, I think that brings us to the end of Coming Together. I've been joined with Professor Rick Pildes and Ben Wolf. I'm Allison Miller. Thank you very much. Another amazing session. Allison, you did a great job of uh, helping to bring the conversation to all of our alumni from Rick and from Ben. There was uh, a lot of information about the legal system, about the Supreme Court, about voters' rights, about where we're going as a country. It was a fascinating conversation, and I wanna thank Ben Wolf from the class of 1971, Rick Pildes from the 19th, class of 1975, and Allison Miller from the class of 1997 for hosting our conversation today. We hope you'll enjoy watching it. Um, we are coming up in the very near future to the annual benefit for the ETHS Foundation. You can find information at supporteths.org on how you can help support uh, programs and 
uh, campaigns at Evanston Township High School. Thank you for watching.